Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today as you're coming in our webinar room today. I'm going to go ahead and take care of some legal housekeeping. The advice chaser, the host of this webinar, is not a registered investment advisor. We cannot and do not give financial advice. Today's presentation is for educational purposes only and cannot be considered advice for any person's individual situation. Advice Chaser regularly hosts informative webinars, such as this one, featuring a variety of knowledgeable professionals, many of whom are licensed advisors. Any opinions, ideas, jokes, or principles expressed by presenters are their own, and however true, funny, or interesting are not endorsed by Advice Chaser. Please do not act on the information you hear today without consulting a qualified financial professional. And uh, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. I want to welcome you here. My name is Marche, I'm the webinar director, and we are thrilled to bring you this educational presentation uh, uh, specifically for business owners. Uh, attendees are muted, but we do encourage you to ask questions using the chat box. The presenters will answer those queries during or after the webinar today as appropriate. Um, we will have a question answer period at the end of today's presentation. If you ask a question in the chat box and we're not able to get to it, go ahead and leave your phone number or email address as well, and we'll make sure someone reaches out to you after today's event. We want this experience to be as educational as possible. Please don't hesitate to ask for a clarification or expansion of the material. We're happy to address those. Well, I'd love to bring you uh, a little bit about our speakers today. Go ahead, Ed, and go to the next slide. Our moderator today is Mark Seiler, a partner and wealth manager with Kingsview Partners in Knoxville, Tennessee. He has a Bachelor of Arts in Economics from San Diego State University and began working as a financial advisor in La Jolla, California. Mark enjoyed finding innovative solutions to clients' as complex problems, and his desire to work with the entrepreneurial-minded helped him thrive as a financial advisor. As Mark honed his skills as an advisor and planner, he looked for a platform that would better pair with his desire to work with clients needing advanced planning and specialized fixes. He found a spot back in Northern California in early 2017, when he joined Trust CFO and assisted in integrating complex tax and estate planning with wealth and investment management. Since then, he has collaborated with Josh Saunders to build Kingsview Partners. Together, they assist individuals on wealth management and tax strategies. And our presenter today is Ed Cotney, the founder and principal at Olympus Tax Business and Insurance Solutions, Inc., and the author of Tax Secrets Made Simple. He hails from Alabama, earned degrees in physiology and aviation management, and served active duty in the US Air Force for 20 years before retiring in 1998 in Northern California. Ed graduated from the prestigious professional mentoring program in Franklin, Indiana, where he became a family wealth counselor in 2000. Lauded for making the complex simple to understand, Ed is well known for providing continuing education classes to professional advisors from basic to sophisticated estate planning techniques, business formations, mergers, private placement, research and development tax credits, domestic asset production trusts, domestic international sales corporation, business succession planning, and multi-generational business planning. And so, We've introduced our guest today. I'm going to go ahead and turn the time over to you, Ed. And before we get into this, I do want to uh, ask our attendees, please go ahead and make sure to ask your questions in the chat. Ed, time for you. Thanks, Marche, and, and hello, everyone. Uh, I'm actually at a tax conference in Reno, Nevada, in a hotel room of all places. Normally, I'm in a beautiful office specifically wired to do this presentation, but uh, please bear with me. And uh, I've been, just spent five days on the Truckee River 
trying to catch some trout and the wind was just enormous and I am sunburned, windburned like crazy. So your cameras are not wrong on your, on your computer monitors. Yes, I am as red as a tomato. Anyway, let's have some fun today to talk about taxes. I mean, we all know that when we wanna go out to have fun, to do a comedy routine or something like that, we wanna go hear a speaker talk about taxes. Well, yeah, sure. But it is an important thing. And, and when Marcia approached me and said, hey, her and Mark were like, hey, we know a lot of people who are thinking about selling their business or an appreciated asset, but they're looking at these huge tax bills. And, and is there a way? Well, yeah, I'm going to show you a couple of ways today. In fact, I'm going to show you some ways today that you've probably never thought of in respect to taxation. And hopefully, the culmination of everything that we're sharing with you today will help you rethink a lot of the tax things you have done over the past years and hopefully get you on a path going in a better direction to pay less tax for the rest of your life. Now, if that is interesting, I'm going to actually prove that there are ways for you to pay less tax. You just got to change a few things in the way you think about money and things of that nature. Now, we're going to end with a case study. This is a case study for John and Mary Smith. This is an actual case. Of course, the names have been changed to protect the innocent. But John and Mary are 65 and they want to sell their business next year. And they've got an S corporation worth about 5.5. They've got the commercial building worth about 5.5. So we have an $11 million transaction with a million dollar basis. So we're looking at a $10 million taxable event. I'm using round numbers because you can probably tell he's got a Southern drawl. I am from Alabama, but yes, I do live near Sacramento, California, been there for years, but yes, Alabama, two digit IQ, roll tide, we have a football team, but hang on, we're going to use round numbers just to make this simple. If it's too many zeros, take off a zero. If it's not enough zeros, add zeros. We're going to focus on concepts, strategies, not percentages. We're going to focus on things that puts money in your pocket. I am a certified exit planner. And I read all these studies that get produced when business owners are asked, when are you going to leave your business? Well, there's four ways we leave our business that are involuntary, death being one of them, disability, divorce, and dissolution. But if we're not going to have one of the four Ds happen to us, we ask these business owners, when do you plan to leave your business? Overwhelmingly, this is the study. The first five years, about half or so plan to leave their business, and then some more go five to 10 years. Notice the gray box there in 9%. I thought that was interesting. About 10% of business owners, I guess, plan to just die at work. But here's the deal. When we go back to these same business owners three years, five years later, and we ask them, when do you plan to save it? Well, in about three to five years. That is always the response. I want you to change that response, and I want to show you why it's important to start targeting your exit. So I have these five critical elements of a successful business exit plan. The first one is target a departure date. This is kind of hard. Some people are like, well, I don't know when I want to retire. I get that. But for the purposes of you putting more money in your pocket, I need you to pick a date. Because by picking a date, it causes you to put things in motion to get ready. You can always postpone the date, but the point is if you start applying some of these concepts that Mark and I think is important for you to understand, it allows you to have things done to be ready for when that day gets here. It is amazing how many unsolicited business offers I have seen in the last three years. And business owners weren't ready, didn't get maximum value for the business and overpaid their tax. So let's pick a target date. Let's just go three years or four years or five years just so we can start thinking. Once we figured out that we, we plan to retire, say, in five years and sell our business, we need to look at if I did sell and I did no effective tax planning whatsoever, would the net proceeds give me the lifestyle that I believe my business should give me? I mean, most of us have our businesses as our primary asset that we're planning on using those proceeds to generate the lifestyle and retirement that we want. Or maybe we're gonna start another business and, and just do a chain of businesses. But my point is this, you have gotta be thinking about net of tax. If I put money into an investment, call it 6%, will it satisfy my needs? So we call that a preliminary financial needs analysis. How much do you need post-transaction to live on? 
and will you hit that target? The next issue is, who is the best buyer for my business? Is it a family member? Is it a key team or a certain manager? Is it gonna be an outside buyer? I had a, a client in Ohio who was in a small town and he was the primary employer. A lot of people. His concern that by selling it to a third party buyer, it would gobble up his employees, maybe gobble up the assets, take the vendor list, et cetera, and shut down the business, which would decimate this little town in Ohio. So he knew he did not want to sell to a third party buyer. So I said, why don't we sell a portion of the business to the employees? Because he had like 135 employees. And so what we did was a fractional ESOP. ESOP stands for an employee stock ownership plan. Basically, it's a pension plan. And so we sold 40% of the business to the employees. It is a little sophisticated. Yes, it does take a lot of planning, work, et cetera. And it's not something that you can get off the internet and do by yourself. But by selling part of the business to the employees, it assured that the business could stay in the community. And then the exit plan for him in five years is to sell the remaining 60% of the business to the employees. This way there's 100% ownership of the business by all the employees increases retention, makes it easier to hire employees, better taxes for the business, huge tax benefits for the seller. So start thinking about who would be the most logical buyer of my business? Is it inside or outside? You need to have a number. What is my business worth? Now I'm not saying go out and spend 20, $50,000 getting an analysis, valuation, stuff like that, but at least get a number that is kind of what you think your business is realistic. And then use that number to help drive everything else. For example, what are my tax rates gonna be if I sold today at $10 million? What would it generate? Start looking at those types of things. And then when we look at our industry, docs, attorneys, pilots, I mean, all types of industries, there seems to be a cycle and so when we start looking at future cash flow estimates, one of the biggest mistakes that I see business owners will do is they go, hey, my industry is going to do great for the next five years. So I want to sell it at the peak of the five years so that the buyer gets to enjoy the downside curve. You know what, folks? Buyers are smart enough to know when not to buy. And that's one of them. When they know that your industry is peaked out and starting to go down, why would they put their money into something that's on a downhill slide? versus some other industry that's beginning its uphill slide. So what we want to look for is when you're able to project that your business is going to do good over the next five years, your exit target is probably in the next two years because a buyer wants to buy on an uphill climb, not when the business is going down in value. So I hope these five little elements right here help you understand why it's so critical that you think about having an exit plan in place, one, to build value of your business, and two, to start looking at what's the most tax effective way for me to sell my business. I did a presentation like this at a major university on the West Coast a few years ago, and it was a mixture of attorneys, accountants, financial planners, professors, business owners, and we sent them a survey and we got 35 participating responses from the group, and we asked them to rack and stack what was most important to your business. I didn't think income tax planning would be their hottest topic. I really thought that something like CEO coaching would be their hottest issue that they would want to get stronger with and building value in their business. But this was the, without question, the group had picked these issues as being the rack and stack hierarchy of what's important to them. I was really surprised to see that so many of these business owners and people who attended did not have an estate plan in place at all a will, a trust, power of attorney, basic fundamentals that every business owner should already have in place. I already know practically every business owner has these objectives, be profitable, great employees, access to cash when I need it, when the bank is willing to loan me money, pay less income tax, wow, what a surprise, avoid lawsuits, and when the day is here, retire on my terms. So those terms are kind of given. When we look at the exit, the right buyer, right price, right terms, wow, what a surprise. Concerned about some of the employees maybe, 
and the business moving forward, those are key issues. Here's what the advisors are not, here's what the advisors are not asking you. What's next in your life? And you know what's sad is when I ask business owners, okay, you sell your business today on the right terms, right money, et cetera. What are you going to do with your life? It's like no one's ever asked the question. I mean, are you married or not? I mean, come on, folks. You've got to start thinking about where am I going to be in five years with my life, at least kind of something. So other questions that do not get asked, emotional, spiritual, social. Now, everybody's willing to talk to you all day long about financial things, how much money in the stock market, how much life insurance, this and that. Everybody's happy to talk to you about black and white numbers on a piece of paper. But you start talking about spiritual, emotional, and when I say social, I don't mean social as far as political things. I mean social as far as your involvement in the community, in philanthropy, that type of thing. Those are tough questions. In fact, when we start looking at things, we really have to start asking, what is the purpose of your life, the purpose of your wealth, and the purpose of your legacy? I mean, what do these things really mean in the scope? So your best advisors are asking the right questions which should be hard. If your advisors are not causing you to squirm in your seat a little bit, taking you to that edge, you're probably just got a yes man, yes woman advisor who's just nodding their head and, and you're on a path to wherever. I beg of you, if your advisors aren't asking you the hard questions, start asking them hard questions and maybe the discussion will go somewhere. These questions need to be focused on why. Why are you going to do this? Why did you not do that? Those are the kind of questions that will help us guys and gals who try to help you pay the least amount of tax, help you get there better. We need to know how you feel about money. It's amazing how many wealthy clients I work with that feel guilty, that feel guilty about the wealth that they have created because I did a seminar in Ohio last year and everybody in the room had a net worth north of $40 million. And, and I'm like, one of the questions I had was, please raise your hand and don't be shy. But how many of you know what powdered milk and powdered eggs are and had to eat them as a child? Because you were dirt poor. Half the room raised their hands. Half the room was multimillionaires and came from poverty. So money is one of those field questions. So how much is enough? And the other question that I'll ask, ask the client, when you pass away, you have created this enormous amount of wealth here. And by the way, enormous amount of wealth could be $500,000 in your family. Okay, just depends on what you think wealth is. I mean, if we drop all that wealth on our ch children outright, I mean, is it going to help them or hurt them? I mean, wow, could you imagine giving every one of your kids $4 million a piece tomorrow? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? And then the other thing that I get people to start thinking about, because we, we look at taxes as being social capital. You know, when I give money to the IRS because I had an income, because I sold an asset that was appreciated, because maybe somebody gifted me too much money at once, or maybe I died and I was too wealthy, according to the IRS. The IRS is a not-for-profit charity when you stop and think about it. It's a mandatory nonprofit organization that we shall fund according to tax law. But the IRS also says in the code that by default, you are a taxpayer and here are the terms, comma, or you can get in charge of your social capital, the money that you're surrendering to the IRS and your state taxing authorities, or you can get in charge of this social capital and redirect it to causes and concerns that you care about. I'm going to walk you through a couple of examples today to help you go, holy cow, I have never heard of that. I did not know that I could be doing more good with my tax dollars than just giving it to the IRS so that Congress can do whatever with my money. I mean, some of us actually have to work hard for the money. So it is one of those feel good things. So if you had that one thing that you knew in your community needed to be solved, what's stopping you from fixing it? It's usually money and time. I'm asked repeatedly, I've been doing this work for 22 years now since I retired from the Air Force. 
what are the key components of successful tax and wealth planning? Well, it's these three things and sometimes four or five, but there's a charity thingy, a business or a trust thingy and an insurance thingy. Overwhelmingly, we do not understand the charity thingy and the insurance thingies. We're good at running our business. We're good at marketing plans. We're good at hiring great employees. We're good at getting rid of dead weight when we need to. We're good at making capital investments, but we're terrible at tax planning. So just for giggles, and when I'm in an in-person seminar, I get to ask people to raise their hands, but is anybody on this call felt like they did not pay enough tax last year? I mean, if you felt like you should have written a bigger check, did you? So I want to walk you through this whole tax piece so that you can go, okay, I, I think I've got a feel for this now. And the other thing that I get questions on all the time, will tax rates go up? Will they stay the same? Will they go down? Yes. The answer is yes. It is always fluid. It is going up. It is going down. It is staying the same. You just have to be able to play the game. And because every year you get a report card on how you did or did not play the game well. So in perspective to the rest of the planet, oh, the taxes in the United States are terrible. It's horrible. We have to, no, we don't. Look where we're at. We're near the bottom. We have a beautiful tax code. You're just not using it. Another issue that we don't understand about taxation, and in my book, I write about the difference between rich people and wealthy people. There is a difference. Rich people are good at making money. Wealthy people are good at making money and keeping more of it. That's the difference between rich and wealthy. If I told you I had an investment that I would double for you every year, you give me a dollar, I will make it a dollar extra next year, and then double the next year, double the next year. So if we have a 40% tax hit on that growth, you gave me a dollar at the end of the year, here's an extra dollar, now you have $2 in your account, well, we have growth on the $1, so it's a 40% tax bill. Going into the next year, I've only got $1.60, and oh, by the way, here's another 40% haircut. That $1 will take 21 years to be worth $139. That's rich people thinking. Wealthy people think a little differently. How do we make this dollar grow with no tax haircut at all? The time value of money, this is probably the most exorbitant example of what tax deferral looks like of never paying a tax because it's a qualified plan or one of the other many countless tools that allows you to defer or eliminate a tax exposure. So when you start looking at all your financial statements, when you start looking at all your real estate investments, are you rich? or are you wealthy? You've got to start looking at things from this perspective, controlling the tax hit every single day. Okay, seven brackets, it changes. This is TCJA that happened in 2017 and 18, nearly doubled our deductions as far as marriage, single head of household. I'm from California, we love taxes in California. And some of you other states like New York, New Jersey, you guys love taxation too. But anyway, just to kind of put things in perspective, there's the tax brackets. We have long-term capital gains at 15 or 20%, depending on your income. Some states have a capital gains tax rate. Some states don't. California, we treat everything as ordinary income. We don't care what it is. From a gift tax perspective, this number tends to change a little bit every now and then. Currently, we're allowed to give $16,000 of after-tax monies to whoever we want to, and it's not an issue. It's the annual giving concept where we can move money around. If we're trying to solve some estate tax issues, in other words, the death tax thing, because you died too wealthy, because remember, Congress identifies that our death tax number, in order to be considered rich or wealthy in this nation at death, if you own personally $12,065,000 of assets per person, you're considered to be rich or wealthy at death. As long as your stuff is worth less than 12 million and change, you're considered poor. So either poor or wealthy in the eyes of IRS when you die. So if you're going to die subject to the $12 million number where it gets taxed at 40% after that, it might make sense to start giving away $16,000 a year. If you need my name and address, so did you can send me $16,000 a year because you don't want to be subject to 40% tax when you die, I'll be happy to send it to you. But my point is, when you become subject to estate taxes, it is a completely different game. 
You have to step up big time. And here we are with the largest, most generous death tax exemption in the history of this country until the end of 2025. Again, the game is going to change in 2026 to something. I will tell you that I think $12 million is too high of a number. Historically, when you look at the death tax calculations in this nation, it's about double what it truly should be to be in alignment with the history of tax in this country. I tell advisors all the time, it is not a good idea to tell clients to count on a $12 million lifetime unified credit being there when they die. You should use a lower number, okay? I love this slide when I'm in front of an audience so I can see the faces. 60% of income tax is optional. 100% of long-term capital gains tax is optional. 100% of death estate taxes is optional for those people who get off their butt and properly tax plan. The IRS is not gonna show up to your house, knock on the door saying, hey, let me show you how to pay less tax. They want you to overpay. In fact, I will tell you categorically that the bulk of you on this call are overpaying your tax. I just see it all the time. When I look at comparing reactive tax planning to proactive tax planning, as a business owner, it's books, it's payroll, it's all those things. And we shove all that stuff over to our tax professional and, and there, God bless them, the last two years for tax professionals has just been chaos. But we all know this. These are the things that are deductible. Buildings, employees, labor, cost of goods. This is stuff that every day as a business owner I'm dealing with. Proactive tax advice is when we start doing advanced retirement planning. For example, I do not consider putting money in traditional IRAs, Roths, 401ks, SEPs, cash balance plans. I do not consider those to be advanced retirement planning. Those are standard retirement planning vehicles and they all have caps. In fact, the caps are pretty small. Areas where I see a lot of missing opportunities, R&D tax credits, cost segregation studies. And if you own a bunch of commercial buildings, I beg of you, ask about cost segregation studies to accelerate the depreciation of your building because if you can accelerate the depreciation of your building, that means you're paying less income tax every year if you have an income tax event. People will go, oh gosh, Ed, if we accelerate the depreciation of my building and I sell it in five or 10 years, that means I have more capital gains tax exposure. Did you not see the slide a few slides back where I said 100% of long-term capital gains taxes is optional with proper planning? So if you're gonna do a cost segregation study for the purposes of reducing your income taxes, you need to also be thinking about how am I gonna sell this building with no or low estate, low capital gains tax exposure. It's about proactive planning. If you're shipping things overseas, an IC disc is a great tool. A lot of employee tax credits have been happening over the last several years. I mean, ERC, I mean, it's, it's crazy all the acronyms we have now. Most CPAs are on top of those things, okay? Here's one that is always a giant blank. Client has a business, they've claimed all the standard deductions, they funded their SEP or a 401k or whatever, they're still sitting here with a huge pile of money, they have a huge tax bill, and nobody suggests, by the way, why don't we do some charitable retirement planning? The problem we have with charitable retirement planning is nothing with the planning, it's you. You hear that word charity and you turn your hearing aids off. Your brain shuts down. It's like there's no way charitable anything can ever be profitable or good for my business and my family. I'm going to give you two examples today to disprove those thoughts. I'm going to show you how to make money off the IRS by using charitable tax planning. And the other thing that I see a huge deficiency on is most of us don't know how to use insurance tax planning properly. Yeah, we know what term insurance is. We buy it because of risk. If we die too young, our family's taken care of. But there are many other types of insurance tax planning that will supersede what a 401k will ever do. You just need to start, start learning to ask the right questions to the right advisors about charitable and insurance tax planning, okay? 80% of the tax professionals live here. They're too busy to live there. 
So four out of five of your tax professionals out there are struggling just to get your tax returns filed by the end of the year, okay? It's hard to be proactive when you're drowning with tax changes, tax forms, tax prep, slow clients, don't get things in time, extensions, you're missing out on a lot of money. I did a seminar like this in the Bay Area a few years ago, and I got a phone call a couple of years later, and they said, Ed, we love you. We want, we love what you had to say. Come help us. We just sold our business. The purchase is done. We're closing escrow in three weeks. We have a $12 million tax bill. Could you come down and fix it? How in the heck am I going to fix a $12 million tax bill in three weeks? It, it's, it's impossible. So my point here is the tax bill, can you imagine what tax $12 million missing from this family's legacy is going to do? You, this, this family should have started doing work two years ago when they started this discussion of thinking about selling their business. Making a $12 million or a $1 million or a $100,000 tax bill disappear in three weeks is very, very difficult. I don't mean we're trying to make the money disappear because we're trying to evade taxation. I'm just trying to say, hey, if we did proper tax planning within the terms of the law, we could get that number down less. I mean, what if we got this down to a $6 million tax bill with that? Yeah, that's a big deal at my house. So I couldn't come fix that. But what I had to do for this family was post-transaction, work even harder, use more of their advisors to do even more work at a greater cost to try to make that tax bill less. It's always best to go into your exit transaction with a primary and a backup exit tax plan, okay? All right, so who's helping the business owners pay less tax and is there a better way? Um, again, I'm back to charity again. 20% of the nation has no charitable receptivity whatsoever. They, they could care less if mom is in line at the soup kitchen. But the bulk of the nation gives to five or more charities every year. In fact, the United States, we're the most giving nation on the planet. There's not even a close second. So I'm going to bring that charitable receptivity back in again, and I'm going to share with you why I think it's a problem. The reason I think this is a problem is because maybe we were taught wrong from the beginning. I mean, I remember... In 1965, as a five-year-old kid going to Mount Carmel Baptist Church in my hometown in Alabama, we'd go to Sunday school at 10 o'clock. Our Sunday school teacher would do the lesson toward the end, passed out those little white envelopes. And in five years old, you try to write your name on it and you put a nickel in. And, and it don't worry if the Sunday school teacher knew you didn't have any money because you was too poor because you're eating powdered eggs and milk. She would give you a nickel. And you put that nickel in and you'd lick and lick and lick and lick that envelope. And then you'd go to big church at 11 o'clock and then the sermon would happen. And at some point the offering plate comes around and like mom and dad, you would put your white envelope in the offering plate. As we got older, we would put a check in the white envelope, not liking the licky stuff as much as we did as a kid. And we kept doing that. That is one dimensional charitable tax planning at its worst. So let me give an example of why I say that's a terrible way to bless a charitable organization. I'm using round numbers again, million dollars. It doesn't matter, million dollars. My CPA is reactive. My CPA has claimed every deduction possible. I'm still sitting here looking at a million dollar adjusted gross income for tax purposes, which is 37% federal, 13 plus in California. I'm at the 50% tax bracket, basically. So trick question, trick question, trick question. If this person made a million dollars of adjusted gross income this year, what is the maximum amount of money or assets that they could donate to the charities they care about? What's the maximum? There is no maximum. There is no law on how much you can give to charity every year. However, there are laws on how much you can claim as a deduction. Remember, you're not mandated to claim expenses on your tax return as a deduction. You're not mandated to claim your charitable gifts. You're only mandated to claim all sources of income. The rest of the stuff is optional. So, if I had a million dollar AGI and I gave my church a million dollars, because it's a cash gift, there's a rule that says 60% of my AGI. So if my AGI is a million, 
60% of that on Schedule A line nine would be $600,000. Even though I gave the Red Cross, the Salvation Army, whatever, a million dollars, I can only claim 600,000 as a cash gift this year. If I gave them a piece of real estate or some stock, I could only claim 30%, $300,000. Whatever I don't use this year, the IRS will let me carry forward into a future year, technically this year plus another five until it's finally used up. So for people who itemize, who make larger gifts than normal, who have complicated tax returns, this is one of the things that I see missing on most people's tax returns the most. They don't use the charitable giving rules. So let me put this in perspective. We made a million dollar AGI. My CPAs pulled off every miracle known to man. I gave $50,000 to the Boys and Girls Clubs. I claimed the $50,000 cash gift. And because I'm in the 50% tax rate, state and federal, again, using round numbers, Alabama roll tide to make this simple, I have saved $25,000 in taxes. Basically, I spent $50,000 in order to reduce my overall tax bill by 25,000 bucks. So now I only have to pay taxes on 950. So 50% of 1 million is $500,000. 50% of 950 is 475. I have only saved $25,000 after making a $50,000 gift. This is why I say most of America has been taught wrong. This is why I say most of America, when it comes to the term charitable planning, they shut down because they've been taught wrong. They've never learned how to do this from a profitable way. So here's the Schedule A 2021. And notice right here, line 11, 12, cash or gift. Line 14 is where it's totaled up. And then that goes over to your 1040. And then basically, this is kind of small to read, but down there on 12A, it says standard deduction or itemized. And so to the left-hand side, it talks about married, filing joint, head of household, what your standard deduction is. And I will say that because of TCJA, we were able to reduce the number of itemized filers tremendously. I mean, that number has dropped tremendously because the deduction is so large. Most of America who gives $1,000 to the hospital, they don't have a number on their Schedule A that's larger than what this standard deduction is. Because remember, these deductions are, if you have marital status of married, filed, and joint, if your Schedule A is larger than $25,000 and change, you would use Schedule A. Most of America, because of TCJA, they make their charitable gifts, but because their itemized deductions on Schedule A is smaller than the standard deduction, their CPA will have them go with the standard deduction. I mean, you do have the right to claim the lower deduction if you want to, but who would be that crazy? So again, TCJA eliminated a large portion of itemized filers. And most people give today, not because they're giving because they want the tax deductions. I can categorically state most people are giving because they love giving and they are not getting a tax benefit on their tax return at all. And what's sad is most people go to their CPA every year and hand them all their checks from their church that shows they made the gift. They actually think that it was applied. When you, can, when you talk to these folks and say, hey, did your charitable deduction yeah, it reduced my taxes. All right, show me. They can't. They got the standard deduction. So I want to show you how to be more than just being a taxpayer. I mean, there's nothing wrong with being a taxpayer. But let's do more than be a taxpayer. Let's start solving real problems. I want a paradigm shift to occur so that you can now start looking at taxation as a wonderful thing. You can start looking at taxation, and, man, I can't wait to see the biggest tax bill in my life so that I can start applying ways to fix it. All right, so let me give an example. Five years ago, you went and saw Mark and said, Mark, here's $40,000. I want you to buy me four positions, $10,000 a piece, and, and I want you to go to town, man. All right, so you guys picked out four investments, and here we are five years later. Well, one investment, that one on the bottom there is kind of like a rock. It's, it's, you gave Mark 10 grand and here we are five years later, 10 grand, you know, you're probably not too happy about that. That stock just kind of did nothing the whole time, five years. The next stock did pretty well in the first couple of years, but the last three years has kind of been plateaued. It kind of flattened out. So that's a highly appreciated 
poorly performing asset now. But I don't want to sell it because if I sell that $50,000 position with a basis of 10 grand, I've got a $40,000 capital gain recognition. I got to pay taxes on that. I'm like, no, well, it's just any minute now that stock's going to turn. I call that a donkey. That is an asset that is just sitting there. It's probably going to go down. But the point is, three years of wealth growth have been flushed down the toilet. The other two positions are rock stars. I mean, we got racehorses. This is a fantastic thing. $10,000 has turned into 90 grand, 110 grand. This is fantastic. Well, those are racehorses. So when you meet with your financial planner, start looking at your portfolio from how many rocks, how many donkeys, and how many racehorses do you have in that thing? And where do you think it's going to go? Because it's getting crazy with the stock market stuff going on right now. Thank goodness I'm not a financial planner. I don't do that stuff. But I want to mess with your brain. Remember a while ago, we talked about giving a $50,000 donation to your favorite charity using your checkbook. I want to teach you a term today called charitable tax harvesting. Now, some of you know what tax loss harvesting is, unfortunately. But here we are in a situation where you've made the decision to bless a charity, 5,000, 50 grand, 500,000. I'm just using 50 grand just to make the numbers simple to understand. And there I am with a donkey worth $50,000. Is there a mo better way for me to bless that charity with five grand, 50 grand, whatever? I'm using 50 again. All right, so the way we learned when we were five years old, get out the checkbook, cash, give that to the charity. We get to claim that on Schedule A, line 11. It reduces my tax by 50%. This is the wrong way that we have done it every single year. And then I got that donkey worth 50 grand over there that's got a $10,000 basis, and it is the same. When you put these numbers on Schedule A, when you bring that forward to page one of your 1040, these numbers are the same. There is no difference in the tax savings here whatsoever as far as your reporting on your tax return. The charity doesn't care if you give them cash or check or real estate. They're going to convert to cash the next day. They have 50 grand to go do the worthy thing that they're charged to do. Most people look at this and go, yeah, they're the same. No, they're not. These are not the same. One of these creates a $15,000 profit. One of these does not. The way that you've done it your whole life does not create a two-dimensional tax benefit. But by giving the stock that had a basis of 10 grand, that has $40,000 of appreciation that has never been tax recognized, but instead you gave it to charity, the charity got the $50,000 block of stock you still got the $25,000 of tax savings. But here's the difference. Notice the second line where it says basis. That $50,000 stock, you only had $10,000 in that game. But that $10,000 bought you $25,000 of actual tax savings on your tax return. You netted $15,000 of profit. It's a two-dimensional tax strategy. If you learn nothing else from today's seminar, if you're ever giving anything to charity, you have to stop and ask yourself, am I giving the best asset to get me the most tax savings? And you can do this with real estate. So cash is easy, but it's one dimensional. Stock and real estate, I can create a two dimensional tax benefit. Why is this important? because I need you to understand the difference of a current gift versus a future gift. A current gift, we get the deduction now, full amount, up to our 30%, 60% rule. A deferred gift, which is what I wanna teach you next, is a strategy where we use an irrevocable trust to create a charitable solution to create tax deductions now. So this strategy is called a charitable remainder unit trust, and we're gonna fund it with a million dollars of cash. I'm using cash just to make the math easy for us to understand. People ask me, Ed, we put a million dollars in this charitable trust. Why is the tax deduction different for somebody who's age 55 versus somebody who's age 75? Well, one of the calculations that we have to use with these charitable remainder trusts is a life expectancy calculation, if it's what we call a, a life trust. Clearly, the guy that's 75 years old is going to get a higher deduction than the guy who's 25, 70, excuse me, 55 years old because the guy that's 75 years old has a shorter life expectancy. He or she is gonna to get to meet God a whole lot sooner 
than he or she who's age 55. So they get a bigger tax deduction because charity is going to get the money sooner. So that's a future gift. So now let's come back to the case study to start bringing all this stuff around. So that we go, oh my gosh, Ed, I thought we were talking about business exit planning. I'm just trying to get you to start the process of learning about are there multiple ways, and I'm only showing two, are there multiple ways to pay less tax when you sell your business or appreciated building or assets? John and Mary, $11 million transaction. They'd love to be able to sell with no tax. Duh. So here's the building and the business. The business is an S-Corp, 5.5, half million dollar basis. We have a 33% total tax issue. They lose 1.6 in taxation. They net 3.8. The building, 5.5, half a million bucks. Because it's a depreciated building, $2 million tax bill, $3.5 million. Client goes home, 7.3. Your silent partner, the IRS, and your taxing authorities, 3.6. Most people go, yep, that's the way it is. Well, it's difficult to do a lot of charitable planning with an S corporation. So we're going to let the S corp be sold outright. We're going to take the building, which has no debt on it, put it into a charitable trust, give mom and dad life income streams. And here's the no tax planning numbers. They're 65 years old. The computer says they're supposed to die in 30.1 years. We take the net of the tax transaction invested at 6%. They're going to get to live on $441,000 a year for the purposes of apples for apples we're gonna make certain mom and dad consume all of their income every year. Therefore, they're not building their wealth anymore just to make this simple to understand. So if we sell the corporation with a $1.6 million tax bill, we put the building into a charitable remainder trust, we create nearly a $1.6 million tax benefit. That means at the end of the day, we have about $11 million under management at 6%. The difference here is by mom and dad using a charitable remainder trust to bypass the taxes on the building and create an offsetting tax deduction for the S corporation, we're gonna force them to live on $660,000 a year for the rest of their life instead of $441,000 instead of being a taxpayer. Do I have your attention now? This is an increase of $219,000 a year for the rest of their life because they bypass the tax exposure using a charitable planning structure. No tax planning, $660,000 a year income stream. Now all this is taxable, both sides of the table. Somebody might say, Ed, that bill is gonna to go to charity. You just robbed the kids of $5.5 million of assets. That's fine, since we got an extra $219,000 because the IRS let us bypass the tax exposure, gave us all these tax benefits. The IRS allowed us to increase our income by $219,000 a year because we didn't pay any taxes. So what if I buy a life insurance policy for 55,000 bucks a year to replace the $5.5 million building gift that's gonna to go to charity? And by the way, if we do the life insurance right, it's gonna be structured in a special type of insurance trust so that it's never gonna be subject to tax when mom and dad die. For those of you who are smart enough who are figuring this thing out, you have just figured out that the IRS is technically paying for that life insurance premium. This is another example of how people don't understand how to use and fund life insurance for retirement and estate tax planning purposes. Everything that I have shown you so far has only been legal since 1969. But for some reason, it's new to you. Mom and dad, $11 million transaction. They have the right to live on $13.2 million for the rest of their life or they can enjoy $19.8 million for the rest of their life. Mom and dad, when they die, assuming we keep no growth, everything is spent every single year. The $5.5 million principal investment goes to the kids tax-free because the step-up in basis rule, the life insurance protected in the life trust, insurance trust goes to the kids tax-free and charity gets $7 million. We have an $18 million estate here basically this is huge compared to what they could have done by not doing any tax planning whatsoever. Mom and dad have this thing set up so that when they pass away, the $5.5 million charitable trust rolls into an endowment. The endowment's gonna get $275,000 a year distributed to their four favorite charities forever. Remember earlier in the slides, if there was one thing you could go fix, what would it be and why aren't you getting it fixed? Okay, we're making that happen, all right?
Another scenario that I had was the client had three buildings and wanted to sell tax-free. Remember, debt into a charitable remainder trust is tough to deal with. So all we did was reposition all the debt onto one building, creating two buildings that were zero debt. We put one building into a CRT by itself. We took a fraction of another building, put it into a charitable remainder trust. This way it's a part gift, part sell. And then we sell the other building outright, pay all the debt. By running the numbers just right, we end up selling all three of these buildings zero times. My point is this type of planning begins with the right questions being asked by the right advisors, getting the right solutions. It takes a little bit of talking, a little bit of learning, and hopefully after this presentation, you're gonna be motivated to go, wow, tax is exciting. I need to go buy a bunch of tax books. It is exciting, but there's tons of tax planning tools out there. Here's just a short list of the different tools out there. And I will tell you right now, every one of these strategies is not a fit for every one of you. Figuring out which one or two or three of these concepts is applicable to you to get the outcome that you're looking for, it takes a little bit of time. So at the conclusion of today's presentation, I hope that I've caused you to think a little bit about your 1040, your annual tax return, your personal income. It lands here with your S Corp, C Corp, whatever, my personal income. My CPA is gonna deduct everything they know how to deduct. We're gonna fund our qualified plans to the max little bitty limit that Congress will let us put money into these plans. But I hope that you're gonna go, wow, I can put a lot of money into these charitable retirement plans, way more than I can ever put in some little 401k or whatever. I can get major tax deductions here. I can have income streams starting when I want them to start. I can have a charitable retirement vehicle start giving me an income stream. I don't have to wait to 59 and a half. So I hope that when you look at what we're doing here, you're kind of going, is there a better way to create a superior retirement income strategy while you're working in your business and after you sell your business? Is there a way to maximize the little bitty pension planning work that you can do and let the charitable retirement planning work you do can be much larger? I have cases going on where my charitable retirement planning is tenfold what those little bitty hours and 401ks can be. Now, I'm not saying don't fund them. I'm saying fund them. It's just, if you make too much money and you're sitting there at the end of the year with a huge tax bill, you need to ask yourself, why didn't I put money into a charitable retirement plan because I've already super funded everything else. The big thing about business owners and their business, they focus a lot on building the value of their business before they sell without ever asking, is there a way to reduce my tax bill? Heck, let's just go with 50%. Start asking your advisors, I want to sell my business for $3 million in three years, and I want to cut the tax bill by 50%. What do we need to be doing? You need to be asking those questions. And then the other thing that I'll tell you is so important, as you're building value, as you're creating this wealth, give great thought to how this wealth is going to transfer to your kids one day when you do stop breathing, Okay. Funding a legacy plan that is good for your family and everybody involved is huge because it's so important that we take those proactive steps to make this happen. And it's because you at some point attended a webinar like this, country board from Alabama with a two-digit IQ kind of rattled your cage a little bit, showing you some tax planning strategies that just totally made you rethink of everything you've done wrong your entire life. Maybe this is the thing that's going to push you a little bit. And I hope it does push you because you should be paying less tax. You should be giving more monies to charity while you're alive and after you're gone. You should be capitalizing on these opportunities because the tax code has only been there since before 1969 to allow you to do this. All right, we've covered a lot today. And as I'm presenting, I'm not able to see any questions or anything. So I'm going to turn it back over to Mark and Marche. All right, we're coming up to the top of the hour. All right, Mark, I know we've got some questions here, so why don't you go ahead? Yes, yes. Ed, uh, uh, thank you. I think you saved my voice today. <laughs> you really took it away there. Uh, awesome. Well, we had a few questions roll in. Uh, one is at what asset level does uh, someone need to start looking at advanced tax planning? Typically, when you've already funded your hours and 401ks to the max 
and you're paying about $50,000 a year in income taxes, that's when you want to start asking, should I be funding a charitable remainder trust or a charitable gift annuity or anything like that that can be an additional retirement plan? Don't get me wrong. I love IRAs and Roths and 401ks. They are retirement resources. But because Congress puts these little bitty caps, I mean, I mean, the most that we can put into an IRA each year is pathetic. Compared to the amount of money I can put into a charitable retirement plan is huge. So if I'm sitting here looking at a huge tax bill and my goal is to live and retire, why am I not putting money into a charitable retirement plan? So I'd say about $50,000 tax bill is when you need to start going, wow, this is painful. Perfect. And, and uh, usually when they get that uh, uh, update from the CPA, uh, it, it uh, singes and burns in their memory. Like, yep, okay, I'm paying, uh, you know, 50,000, got it. I'm paying too much. What I like is on April 14th, when the CPA calls to say, hey, come by, bring your checkbooks, it's time to sign your returns. <laughs> and you see a number that just blows your mind. I, I tell my clients, you need to know what your end of year tax exposure is going to be in October. Mm -hmm. You need to know because that Q4 gives you the ability that if your number is going to be something that will choke a horse to death, it gives you a couple of months to do something. And this is where you get to ask those questions. Well, we funded the hour. We funded the cash balance plan. We funded everything. We claimed every deduction possible. And now we're looking at something that's illegal. Well, no, don't look at something that's illegal or questionable. Do something simple that's safe, like a charitable retirement plan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, perfect. And then we had another question um, uh, come in about, you know, your, your horse, donkey, and rock scenario. Uh, at what point do you consider an investment a donkey? when it plateaus. So okay. when I see an investment that's growing and then the trend is as flat and it stays flat for a while, let's say four or five months. And then I start doing my research on that investment. What's that company doing? Why are they being flat all of a sudden? Because they were growing okay and now they're kind of flat lying. What's going on here? And then I can make that educated decision of, okay, now I've got a position here that's getting flat. The problem is, if I just outright liquidate that privately owned asset, um, I'm going to have a capital gains tax bill. So this is where that play is. If you're already philanthropic, where you're stroking a check to your charities anyway, and probably not getting a tax deduction, this becomes even more powerful. And the other thing that I see is that folks that are over 70.5 years of age, they're still making their charitable gifts, not able to claim it because their standard deduction is higher than their charitable gifts are they're not using money from their retirement plans. Once you're 75 and a half, you can give money from your IRA, it's called a qualified charitable distribution straight to charity. And again, you get a two type level of tax benefit. One, you're not having to take any income from the IRA first to get your tax return. And then the money's going to the, to the charity tax free. Now, when you get 72, you have to take an RMD. And yes, there is legislation up on the hill right now that's trying to move that RMD from 72 to 73, actually to 75 on a phase-in period. And I think we're probably going to see that happen. But people, when they're making their charitable gifts and they have these IRAs, they don't understand the smart way to do things. And I would beg of you that if you're over the age of 70 and a half and you're making cash contributions, whether it's itemized deductions or not, you need to ask, should we give, be giving from the IRA first? And you will be shocked to find out that overwhelmingly you should be giving from your IRA first. Yeah. And then uh, another one came in because you had mentioned the, um, the estate tax uh, being at $12 million, but not to plan for that. Um, we had someone ask, what's a more realistic uh, number people should be looking at? An opinion. Remember that slide at the beginning. Uh -huh. <laughs> You're not going to be held accountable for whatever country board from Alabama has to say. My opinion is today, I think the fair number would be around 6 million. Okay. Because that puts us in a line with the last 40 years of estate taxes. My, my argument is this, if you plan for the low tax issue and God takes you off this planet early while we still have that $12 million tax, your kids get even more. And then you got some states that have state death taxes like Oregon and Washington. Uh, I just ran the case yesterday in, in Washington. The first $2.1 million is tax-free per person. And so even though 
you might live in Oregon as a single person with an $8 million estate. You have no federal death tax exposure, but the first $2.1 million of your estate goes tax-free to your kids. And then Oregon has this progressive scale that starts taxing every dollar after $2.1 million up to $8 million as a state death tax. So we've got about a dozen states that still have the state death tax calculation too. We're at the top of the hour. Well, we have reached the end and we and we could go on, but we do need to uh, let our speaker and our moderator go. I want to thank both Ed and Mark for being here today and for the organizations that have made this webinar possible. Here at Advice Chaser, we're all about helping you find a financial advisor who's a great fit for your life and your financial questions. Every one of our advisor partners has agreed to offer a free initial consultation to anyone we introduce them to. Find out more by going to advicechaser.com and clicking on the link to find an advisor. Once again, from Advice Chaser and from I'm assuming Ed and Mark, <laughs> thank you so much for coming and we will see you at another webinar soon. Bye everybody. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank and we're getting some thank yous from our audience. Thank you very much for being here. Bye, everyone. Bye.